Hello. You are listening to the Grieving Parents Sharing Hope podcast. We are here to walk with parents on their unwanted journey of child loss, guiding them to a place of hope, light, and purpose, not in spite of their child's death, but as a way to honor his or her life. And now, here is your host, author, speaker, and bereaved parent, Laura Deal. Hi. Thank you for spending some time with me today. Many grieving parents that I talk to share about how hard it is that their life has come to a screeching halt after the death of their child, and they don't understand how everyone else around them just keeps going. How does the rest of the world keep going, right? I remember feeling that way myself. I specifically remember that thought while I was sitting in my car at a stoplight. It was a busy intersection in our town, and even though... I was out and about. I was very numb. I was going through the motions and doing only what was absolutely necessary outside my home. And I remember I could see people walking. There were people in the cars around me having conversations and cars driving past me like the world was okay. And it was hard not to get angry and to just feel like I just wanted to scream at everyone for acting like things were normal, that life was normal. Eventually, and by eventually, I mean like two or three years, I found myself running those same errands without the sense that because my world had come to an end, everyone else's should too. That was until the summer of 2018 when my husband Dave got a phone call from his dad who was having such intense back pain it was causing him to vomit and He was asking Dave to take him to the ER to get checked out. And eight hours later, the family was being called to sit by my father-in-law's bedside, waiting for him to pass from this world with a ruptured aorta that was inoperable. Now, when Becca died in October of 2011, I had no grid whatsoever for facing a deep loss. The death of my daughter, and some of you probably have a similar experience, was the first time a close family member had died. Dave and I had been blessed to have all four of our parents with us up to that point. I'd lost grandparents, but they weren't ones that I was like super close to because I didn't grow up around them, that kind of a thing. So that summer, not only did we lose the first of you know our four parents, but Dave and I became instant caregivers to his mom who had dementia and other health issues, and she needed someone with her 24-7. Now, we didn't realize how bad it had gotten until Dad died, and she happened to have a doctor's appointment scheduled that week, and Dave took her, and the first thing the doctor said was, can she move in with you? And we had just bought the Hope Mobile. We had just, like that week, kind of moved into it in our campground, And the plan was that we would live in it for the summer at our local campground, and that would give me an idea of what I needed, what I didn't need before we actually pulled out. My oldest son had purchased our house, and a lot uh, just came with the house. And so there were some things that I knew I could grab if I needed to or, you know, leave back behind if I didn't need it. And so obviously Dave's mom could not move in with us. And so for three months, Dave and I took shifts living with her as we jumped through all the hoops of going through the process to get her placed in an assisted living facility so we could still pull out in the Hope Mobile in October, which is what she wanted as well. And at that point, life once again came to a standstill for me. I saw what looked like life going on as normal for those around me while my world had been totally turned upside down. We had another son and his family who had purchased their first home. We weren't able to help them move or get settled much at all. My youngest son moved as well. We weren't able to help him either. Plus this big transition of my oldest son buying our house and trying to be on the road full time. It was just crazy and upside down and messed up, right? And I just felt frozen. And things like my writing to keep up with blogs and emails 
life itself was spotty at best because Dave and I were taking turns being full-time caregivers. And even our marriage felt like it had come to a standstill because most of the time, one of us was at mom's apartment and the other one of us was at home. But the thing is, I knew I would be able to get through this new situation that had my life at a complete standstill because I have faced the worst thing that could happen in my life, which was the death of one of my children. And I've come out the other side and I was able to live again when I did not think that was possible. And that's kind of what we're talking about today is when life comes to that standstill, a screeching halt, your life has stopped and everyone around you is still living life as if it was normal, right? And I know that for some of us, or I guess maybe all of us, even at the very beginning or those first few weeks or months, maybe the first year or two, we just feel like, I can't, I can't go on. I can't keep doing this. I, I just, I can't keep going. Now, first of all, you know, I felt that way too. So I, I know what that's like. And I want to say that I still have days like that occasionally when life is just overwhelming and triggers can hit really hard unexpectedly. And I wanted to share with you what I do when those days hit. Now, fortunately, I'm not living there like many of you listening probably are, where every day is like that. But let me just share some things with you that may help, okay? So for me personally, when I get hit really super hard and I just feel like I can't go on, I cry. (laughs) Tears have always come easily to me. I have some kind of funny stories from when I was little of how easily tears would come to me. I don't know if I've ever shared this on the podcast before and I wasn't planning on it, but I'll throw it in here. One story, if you've heard me speak, you may have heard me share this, but in... Wisconsin, we would travel there as a family because we moved around a lot. And uh, I didn't live in Wisconsin until I was in my middle school years. But when I was younger, we came up here to visit and Wisconsin Dolls is very popular. And at that time, there was a, a place called Storybook Gardens and you could go there and actually see A lot of your nursery rhymes, either in great big statues or people dressed up in costumes. And one of them was Little Bo Peep. And she was walking around Storybook Gardens and she had lost her sheep. And I cried. I cried because little Bo Peep had lost her sheep. I was so sad about that. And so she actually went and got her sheep and found me in this big place to show me she had found her sheep. And we have, back then, we took slides. You know, slide pictures were a big thing. And we have a slide of me standing next to little Bo Peep and her sheep, all happy because she had found her sheep. Another story about how easily tears come to me is uh, Winnie the Pooh, the big main movie, came out when I was very, very little. And my mom took me to the theater to see it. Now, this is not something I remember. This is something that she shares a story that she shares from my childhood. But when he, if you've ever seen the movie, he gets stuck in Rabbit's hole because he ate too much honey and he gets too fat and he can't get back outside Rabbit's house because he's too fat for the hole. So he has to be stuck in the hole for like three days, not eating anything while his tummy gets smaller. And so they decide, okay, well, let's try. And everybody gets together and they do this big heave ho thing to try to pull him out and he pops out like a cork and he goes flying through the air and he gets stuck in a tree, in a hole in a tree. And it shows him he got stuck in a tree where the bees were making honey. And and I'm crying in the theater because Winnie the Pooh is stuck again. And my mom had to tell me that he was happy because he was stuck in the tree with all of this honey and he was yum, 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 eating this honey. So anyway, (laughs) all of that, just a little side note there of entertainment, I guess, but just to tell you that tears have always come easily for me. And that may not be the case for you. And that's been both a curse and a blessing, as you can probably guess. But anyway, when those days hit, I just let myself have that good cry, and it might be a good sobbing, ugly cry. But that makes me want to climb back into bed even more and just not go through the day, right? Because as we all know, that can be very draining. But the thing is, deep down, 
I also want to get past the roadblock that has me feeling so overwhelmed and ready to give up on so many things and just not wanting to finish out life. So one of these times that happened, I found myself writing an email to one of my friends and I was just dumping out all my woes and all my frustrations. I mean, it was a long email. And what I discovered is that did three things. As I was writing everything down to this friend, it let me see that the things that I was really upset about were valid or they weren't valid, okay? And that was helpful to me. Writing this all down got it out of my system, keeping me from just holding on to it internally. Because when I hold on to things like this internally, I start seeing myself as a victim and I start having this martyr mentality, which no one around me appreciates for good reasons. And it also affects me physically and my body starts to shut down. And the longer I hold on to these stressful things internally that just have me want to just shut down and quit life, the longer I hold on to those things internally, the longer it takes me to recover from that physically. I have adrenal issues, thyroid issues, and none of those started until Becca died. And the stress on my body, that it, it can easily pick up those stresses again, and I find myself dealing with these physical issues in, in can be major ways. And the third thing that it did for me, writing all this down in, in a letter, an email to my friend, was that I found I gave myself a different way of looking at it and possible solutions to get around some of those frustrations because it's like I'd write it and it's like, well, I suppose I could, you know, that kind of a thing. So after I reread the full page and a half that I had written to my friend, I canceled the email. I deleted it instead of sending it. Now, why did I do that? Well, first of all, she really did not need me. Well, first of all, she really did not need to have me dump on her like that. <laughs> and at that point, I felt better. So this email really didn't need to be sent. So the next time you are feeling that overwhelming sense of, I can't do this, I can't go on, or I give up, I suggest having a good cry, if you're like me, and then tell someone in writing what's going on inside of you. You don't have to be an author. You don't have to be good at grammar. I don't want you to edit this as you're writing it. Just write it out. And if you feel like, I don't know who I would write to, write it to me, okay? Hey, Laura, you said to write to you, so here I go. And just start writing it out. And then read through what you've written. And if you've had a release, don't send it for the same reasons I didn't. And even if you don't have a release, I suggest hanging on to it, all right, and not sending it out. But I also encourage you to destroy it, delete it, get rid of it, throw it away, make sure it's gotten rid of. Because one thing it can do in the opposite direction is that it can cause you to stay in that woe is me and you just keep reading over and over again what you wrote and why things are so terrible and who you're frustrated at and, and just rehashing it in that way. So either way, I suggest getting rid of it. And I also want to encourage you to do something physical along the line of self-care to release some of this pressure to make you feel better. And the reason I suggest something physical is because when we do something physically, it spills over into making us feel better, a little bit stronger emotionally, mentally, and even spiritually. It doesn't have to be big. How about just a walk around the block or a nice warm bath with candles or maybe not letting yourself pig out on something in self-pity that you would normally do. That is something that you can do physically that's going to help you. And I can't emphasize enough how important self-care is in our grief, especially when we don't care one bit about what's happening to us. And I know that's the case. We don't care. You know, people say you can be thankful for breathing. I'm not thankful for breathing. I'm not thankful that I'm still here. I don't want to be breathing. I don't want to be here. I just want to go be with my child. And I know it doesn't make sense to other people. And sometimes it doesn't even make sense to ourselves because in our mind, we have reasons to still be here, but our heart just doesn't want to be here anymore. And we can't 
I, I could not imagine living out the rest of my life here without Becca, even though I had my other children and I had two grandchildren at the time. One of them was Becca's daughter. I just could not wrap my head around living out the rest of my life without my daughter being here with me. And so that's actually, it is, I think it's called slow suicide when we don't take care of ourselves because we don't care whether we live or not. It, it's not that it's like I wasn't planning, I wasn't making plans to, to kill myself, I wasn't suicidal in that way, but I, I didn't care if I lived or died, so I didn't care if I took care of myself. And you will get to a point where you start to care, and I don't want you to be overwhelmed by how, I guess, deteriorated or how far you have gone down physically that you feel overwhelmed at trying to get yourself healthy again. So I really want to encourage you, do little things for self-care, even when you don't care take care of yourself in some way. And one of those things could be after you have this good cry and you write this out, maybe that physical thing is going back to bed. <laughs> like I feel like doing after I've cried and I'm totally drained because my my father-in-law who I just talked about that passed that one summer, he had been known to say sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is to get some sleep. <laughs> and I know some of us, we can't sleep. I'd love to sleep, but I can't sleep. And and you may need some help in that, but if you need to go back to bed, then that's okay if that's how you're going to take care of yourself because this grief journey really is about you. It's not about anybody else. It's not about uh, what they think you should be doing. It's about you, especially if you're in the first couple of years because that means you're in survival mode. You're not trying to figure out how to have a life of meaning and purpose again. You're not trying to figure out how to live without your child. You're just trying to survive. And that is like a minute by minute thing sometimes for us. So I want to encourage you to just keep watching those who are ahead of you as a hopeful reminder that maybe, just maybe, life won't always feel like it's at a standstill for you either, just like the rest of us felt at one time as well. I want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is verses 3 and 4 and verse 7 to you. And it says, what a wonderful God we have. He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the source of every mercy, and the one who so wonderfully comforts and strengthens us in our hardships and trials. And why does he do this? So that when others are troubled, needing our sympathy and encouragement, we can pass on to them the same help and comfort God has given us. In our trouble, God has comforted us, and this too, to help you to show you from our personal experience how God will tenderly comfort you when you undergo these same sufferings. He will give you the strength to endure. And I feel like I am so very honored to be one of those people that you can look at who's been on this path, who's been comforted by God, who can then comfort you and bring you hope and encouragement. Being one of those people that wondered how I would ever get past Becca's death to be able to live again. And a few years into this journey, I truly believe that you will be that person. You will be a grieving parent sharing hope and have others wondering that same thing about you. Plus, you will know like I did, that you can get through anything else this world throws your way because you have already been through the worst of the worst. And you made it, you're here, and now you can walk with others that God brings across your path. That's something that you can pray into, and maybe you don't have the hope for it now, but I have the hope and belief for you until you have your own. So, Something interesting has been happening. This podcast has grown to the point where I have started being contacted by businesses asking me to consider having them be a sponsor of the Grieving Parents Sharing Hope podcast. 
And that means pitching products and services your way as part of the podcast. And then obviously, GPS Hope would get some finances from that. They would pay to become a sponsor. The thing is, I don't ever want to do that to you. However, this podcast is an outreach of GPS Hope, Grieving Parents Sharing Hope, which is a 501c3 charitable organization. And we can do what we do because of financial gifts and partners. Now, let me just say this is not a big pitch or a pressure for you to send us money. So I hope you don't fast forward this part. I just want to do two things here right now. So I hope you're still hanging in here with me. One is to remind everyone listening that you can sponsor an episode in honor of your child. You get to pick the week. You write out what you want everyone to know about your child that I will read to thousands of listeners, including those who listen for years to come as they discover this podcast and they go back to listen to previous episodes. It's out there forever. Your child and what you want people to know about your child. And to sponsor a podcast episode, it's only $50. Now, obviously, I feel like that's a win-win for all of us because It does provide finances to keep GPS Hope going, while at the same time, it allows you another way to leave a legacy for your child, letting others know how special he or she is. Now, if you want to do this, like I said, you get to pick the week that you want to sponsor a special date. Just go to gpshope.org and hover over the Donate tab, and you'll get a drop-down menu, and one of them says Sponsor a Podcast Episode. Just click on that and all the information will be there for you to fill out. And I will also put a link to that in the show notes. Now, the second thing is, I don't know if you've ever heard of Patreon, but it's pretty popular for podcasts to use that as a way for listeners to make really small weekly or monthly contributions to their podcast. Now, when I say small, I mean like 2 or $3 a week, which comes out to like $10 or $12 a month. And a lot of small contributions put together can add up quickly. So for instance, it's just 10 of you. If you were to decide, I want to be one of 10 people who want to support this podcast at $3 a week, that would help out GPS Hope with $120 a month for 10 of you to do that. Now, Dave and I, we don't want to use a program like Patreon to do that because they're a business and they take a cut from the money donated. And I feel like anyone who decides they want to do this, something like this, just become a a monthly partner with us and just help this podcast keep going. Uh, I I just feel like you would like 100% of that to go towards this podcast and GPS Hope, not for some business to take a cut of it. So if you do want to be one of those who gives like weekly or monthly and set up an automatic payment, Now, some of you may want to do more than $10 or $12 a month. Maybe you want to do five or less. Maybe you want to do $5 a month. That's fine. Maybe you want to do $20, $30, $50. There's no set amount. But just go to gpshope.org slash donate. And there's a place there you can do like an automatic payment. It'll come out automatically every month so you don't have to think about it. You can also go there to gpshope.org slash donate if you just want to give a one-time special gift. Maybe you feel led to do that here at the beginning of the year. So, oh, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well if you want to set something up monthly or you want to just give a special gift. Okay, so enough about that. Let's go ahead with this week's birthday segment. Now, this past week I had someone ask me, how can I get my child on the birthday segment? And I want to say that I share that every single week after I read through the birthdays, I let you know how you can have your child added. And I also put a link to that in the show notes, how you can have your child added to the birthday segment the week of his or her birthday. So let's go ahead with the birthdays for this week. Robert Schaefer DeVries was born on February 4th and is forever 35. Ava Shaw was born on February 4th and is forever 20. Bradley K. Bonger was born on February 7th and is forever 37. Brenton Smith was born on February 10th and is forever 24. We celebrate with these families the day these children came into the world. 
We know it will always be a very special and important day. If you would like to have your child's birthday announced the week of his or her birthday and shared with the other listeners, I would love to be able to do that. All you have to do is go to gpshope.org slash birthdays. Just fill out that form, submit the needed information, including the pronunciation of their name if uh, sometimes the first name or last name gets you know, kind of slaughtered because I don't want to do that. I want to make sure I say their name correctly. So be sure to fill that part out if needed. Just submit that information and Dave will send you an email that week to remind you to listen so that you can hear your child's birthday shared. I will also put a link to that in the show notes. And it came to pass. Those can be, for me, I think, some of the most encouraging words in the Bible. Some translations say in time or after that. In other words, it won't always be like this. If you're frustrated that life is going on while you feel so very stuck, I want to help you to think of it maybe a little bit differently. Maybe it's actually a good thing to see life going on around you because that means you are surrounded by people whose lives came to a standstill but they've been able to move forward at some point. I know when I talked about seeing all those people whose life was just going on as normal, I remember at one point having a thought that I may be looking at someone who has lost a child and I have no idea because I don't see them looking like I look right now. I don't see the devastation on their face. And so maybe if other people can get through it and I can't even tell they've lost a child. And that doesn't mean that we don't think of our child, we don't remember our child, it's like they never existed, or other people don't remember our child. It's just that thought, if they can go on and figure this out, then somehow I should be able to go on and figure that out. And that includes bereaved parents like Dave and me. You can see that I was once also in that same place of suffocating darkness, and I have been able to get out of that darkness and live a life of meaning and purpose again. It is possible to do that, not in spite of your child's death, but because of his or her life. And I'm not saying that life goes on as normal the way it was before the death of your child. That would be just absolutely impossible. What I am saying is that if you keep going, one day, one hour, one breath at a time, if that's where you are. And I know sometimes it feels like you can't. At some point down the road, keep going, and you will find yourself feeling a stirring of being alive again. And just once again, keep watching those who are ahead of you as a hopeful reminder that maybe, just maybe, it can happen to you also. And thank God for putting us in your life so that you can see, you can have visual and and hearing, and you can have something tangible in front of you to show you that it is possible. So please hold on. Pain eases. There is hope.